Hey, and welcome to the Wolfpack Coaches Show presented by Lexus of Reno. It's great to have you as we begin a brand new football season. The 2013 campaign is underway. The Wolfpack played their opener last week against UCLA. This week, the home opener coming up as the Pack will take on UC Davis at Mackey Stadium coming up on Saturday. That'll be a 6.05 kickoff time. We'll be on the air with all the coverage beginning with the Bud Light Tailgate Show at 4.30. Great to be here at the Little Waldorf Saloon this year, our new home for the Wolfpack Coaches Show. Certainly excited to be here, and we invite you to come down and join us every Wednesday night. We'll be here with Coach Poley and talking Wolfpack football. And Coach, I know uh, after the game on Saturday night, you said obviously there's going to be some things you have to go back and, and look at on tape. After you and the staff sat down and, and digested the UCLA game, what, what comes out of the opener for you? Uh, my lunch. <laughs> um, there, was, there, there were some positives. There were some guys that really played well. And, and uh, the obvious positive is that uh, that is a really good football team we played. I think when it's all said and done, they're going to be ranked higher than 2021 uh, where they were going into the game. Uh, but uh, the obvious positive was that we, we went right down the field in the two-minute drill right before the half, and we're sitting there at 17-13 and uh, really uh, not only keeping it competitive but really had a chance to, to uh, you know, win the game. Unfortunately, we had a really bad second half, and we were able to look at some performances and, and take some good things away, but uh, a lot of it has been, been about this week, about getting back to work and just – trying to do what we do and do it a little bit better than we did last week. I think any time you go into a new season, there's things that you can only learn once you get out there in the heat of competition against somebody else. What did you learn about your team in the opener? What did maybe they learn about themselves in the first game? Well, I, I think uh, I think we need to tackle better, that's for sure. And, uh, and I think our team recognizes that. And that's one of those things that in the first game you have concerns about because it's hard to replicate in practice. You don't want guys launching and leaving their feet, and, and uh, you know that that was a, that was a concern, and, and obviously it's something we need to do better. Uh, I, I do uh, I do felt like it took us a little while to get adjusted to the speed of the game, and that's a fast football team we played. But uh, you know, I thought halfway through the first quarter we were we had gotten caught up to it, and we were playing a little bit better. And then, you know, frankly, we just. You know, it's a great lesson, and it's a great experience for us just in terms of dealing with some adversity and, uh, you know, making sure that we don't let one bad play turn into two, turn into three, turn into a bad half, which is what happened to us. And the only way to learn those lessons is through experience. For a new staff like yourself, working with a new team, and to have your first game come on the road in that place, the Rose Bowl, one of the, the great stages in college football, against a really good football team, as you mentioned, how difficult is that challenge for your ball club? That would not have been what I would have planned. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would have rather played Davis first at home and then gone to play the ranked team on the road. Um, but the schedule is what it is. And no matter what happens, there's there's always lessons to be learned. There are always positives to be taken out of the experience and we should grow from it and I have no doubt that uh, even though the second half was really lousy and we don't hide from that one bit it was bad uh, we will take things away from it we'll learn from it and there were some highlights and the you know, we'll emphasize those and, and continue to grow. There was a lot of questions for you going into the first game. What was this going to be like, your first game as a head coach? You said you would take some time before kickoff to try to appreciate the stage and where, where you were at. What was the experience ultimately like for you being out there? Uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It was neat. Um, I, there was a point where uh, I looked over and I saw my wife, Laura, standing on the sidelines. And, and uh, to be able to share that moment with her was pretty cool. And, um, you know, to... Uh, to lead the team out of the tunnel as opposed to sneaking out early so you can get out there and get set up. And, um, you know, all of those firsts, I think, uh, you know, I I enjoyed them. I don't think I was overwhelmed by the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if I had to grade myself, I'd say it was about a B minus. I need to stop being emotionally hijacked by the officials. Uh, (laughs) After two years at Stanford, I was never a fan of the Pac-12 officials. Now you come in as a non-conference member. And it only gets worse. Uh, but, um, 
I need to do a better job of 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 uh, staying in the moment, you know, and and uh, and not letting a, uh, a a bad call or a missed call, you know, hijack me for a minute or two. And and uh, look, I'm no different than the players. We had a bunch of young guys that were playing mm-hmm. their first college football, and that was my first game as a head coach. And I expect that our young players will get better with experience. And, and I know that uh, I will do a better job now that I've been able to go through it one time. And, you know, it's just one of those experiences. Mm-hmm. I'm 38. It's the first time around. You know, you're going to make some mistakes, just like Coach Alt did a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when it's your first year, you're going through it, and, and hopefully you can grow from it. You were very clear about the fact that there would be no moral victories in this game. That there was, that you were not going to hang your hat on just a, a, we did this well, we did that well. But there were some positives that, to, that came out of this game. A very tough guy at Anthony Barr, an All-American, and you were pretty happy with what Joel was able to do. I was thrilled with what Joel Batonio did. If uh, Anthony Barr is a first-round draft pick, as he has been touted to be, then Joel Batonio is a high draft pick himself because, uh, uh, to my recollection, Anthony Barr made a couple of plays, but two of them, uh, we simply didn't block him. They were busted assignments. And I can't recall a time in pass protection where he beat Joel. Uh, So... I think certainly even with the half a dozen scouts that came through this week that have had the chance to look at that tape have all recognized, wow, this guy's a real player. And he, and he is. He's an outstanding player. And on the on a big stage against a big-time guy, he played fantastic. Take us through that final drive of the first half for your team. You get the ball at your own 19-yard line with just over two minutes left. You're down 17-6 at that point. Put together a fantastic drive to only be down four at halftime. Take us through that drive, if you would, and what you saw your team be able to do to get yourself in that position at the break. <laughs> well, when we opened the drive, we said, run the ball and let's get off the field. <laughs> we had every intention. We didn't want to come out throwing it because that's not who we are. Uh, you know, we are we are going to – our passing game is going to be set up by our ability to run the ball, whether it be with the running backs or the quarterbacks. So we came out and said, okay, let's run the ball a little bit. And if we get a chunk play, if we get an 8, 10, 12-yard gain, then we'll speed it up a little bit and try and go. But the last thing that we wanted to do with, you know, roughly two minutes to go, and I know they had timeouts left, the last thing we wanted to do was go three and out, punt, we had just been on the field for a long time on defense. So when the drive started, it was about really let's, let's you know, run the ball, see if we can get a first down, milk the clock. And we said on the headset, if we get a chunk play, get ready to go a little bit faster. And I believe there was a penalty on UCLA at some point in the drive, which helped us. And uh, when that occurred, we said, okay, uh, all right, let's go. Let's get, let's try and get some points out of this. And I was very, very pleased with the job of the offensive coaches, the communication between uh, the offensive staff and myself when we flipped the script and decided, okay, let's go for points and the amount of conversation that was going on and making sure what we're going to do with our timeouts. And, and uh, we never even – I don't believe we ever used a timeout on the drive. We managed – the quarterback offensively, uh, the unit – the coaches managed the drive very, very well. And we were down there, you know, inside of 20 seconds knocking on the goal line, but could have called anything we wanted because I believe we were sitting on two timeouts. So we weren't we weren't uh, uh, pigeonholed on having to throw the ball, which obviously is good for us. And, and you know what? The one thing that Bear's mentioning, too, is as pleased as I was to go down and get the touchdown on that drive, we were inside the five twice right. in that first half. And we walked away with two field goals. And I don't know if our fans noticed on television. I don't know if they showed it. But on a false start, we had a fake field goal called where we're walking in the end zone. I mean, we're walking in. Well, and that was one of the questions that came in on Twitter. Somebody wanted to know, was there a fake field goal called there? What actually happened in that situation? And they also wanted to know, what was the thinking behind the fake field goal in that particular instance? The thinking was, that let's try and win the game. Uh, you know, we, we knew that field goals... Uh, the UCLA offense was too too explosive. The quarterback's too good. There's they have too many big time players, and we knew we were going to need to score touchdowns in the red zone. And we had the exact look that we wanted, and we just got a little itchy on the left side of the line. And and a guy came out of his stance about a half a second too quick, 
and it's uh, it's unfortunate. It's a first game mistake, and you you really try hard to say, hey, we cannot make first game mistakes. We got to keep our poise, keep our cool. But we came out of our stance, and unfortunately, it it probably cost us a touchdown because when you look at the tape, it it, it played out exactly like we thought it was going to, and. I believe Chase Tenpenny would have waddled into the end zone and fallen down for a touchdown. <laughs> you mentioned uh, that final drive of the first half. You talked about your ability to, to get down the field. Cody went in. He was actually given a touchdown initially before the review. While they were reviewing the play, I saw you over talking to the officials. Are you asking them at that point, hey, if this doesn't go our way, where are we going to have the ball? Starting to think about what might be coming next? That's exactly what we're thinking about. Where's the ball going to be spotted? How much time is going to be on the clock? And one of the first things that you do in a situation like that is you call the player over. Cody, did you get in? He said, ah, I don't think I did. Well, then automatically, if he's not confident he got in, well, then that automatically flips our thinking. We're already talking talking about, okay, what's the next call, what's the next play, and then you're talking to the officials about, okay, where's the ball going to be spotted, because uh, I think they knew pretty quickly off review that it wasn't a touchdown. What took them a little while was to figure out where the, where was the ball going to be spotted and how much time was going to be on the clock. All right, home opener coming up this week. Nevada takes on UC Davis Saturday night at 6 o'clock. We'll have more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show presented by Alexis of Reno coming up right after this.
Welcome back to more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show presented by Lexus of Reno, who invites you to test drive a luxurious Lexus automobile today. Or for more information, you can visit Lexus.com. The Wolfpack football team had their opener last week against UCLA. The home opener coming up on Saturday against UC Davis. That'll be a 6 o'clock kick at Mackey Stadium. We'll be on the air with a Bud Light tailgate show beginning at 4.30 as the pack gets set to play at home for the first time this year. Head coach Brian Polian with us as we've been talking about last week's game against, uh, against UCLA. Coach, I just wonder what that locker room was like at halftime after putting together that drive we were talking about being down only four points what was it like going in there with your team uh i I thought the guys were pretty calm uh you know i thought our coaches did a pretty good job of getting everybody up together and started talking about the adjustments and and uh you know i wonder sometimes if they expected to be that close you know i really do Mm -hmm. and um you know really i i was not i was not concerned about our ability to come out and and play uh, obviously, you know, there's a couple third downs on the opening drive for UCLA where we don't get off the field. The three and out and the block punt, I think, really knocked the wind out of the football team. And, and you know, it, we, need to, we need to grow beyond that. We need to be mature enough and, and we need to be energetic and passionate enough that, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't knock us down because at one point we score, it's, 20, it's 37-20. It's a 17-point game. If you can make one big play, you're within two scores, and, and you know, now you're still, you're still in the game with a chance to win it. And, unfortunately, I, I, I felt like, at least on the sideline, that, that when the block punt occurred, it kind of took the wind out of our sails, and we just kind of got worn down. And it became a very tough second half for your defense. I think some of that having to do with the fact that they were on the field for, yeah. for such a long time. As you look at the defense in this first game, what did you see from that unit specifically? Well, I, uh, I saw some young corners that, uh, or at least corners that don't have a ton of a playing experience uh, that that tried to play a little bit safe and and uh, you know that was part of the plan too was to make them go the long haul we 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 talked repeatedly about we didn't want the ball thrown over our head um, I saw um, I saw some uh, some young defensive linemen in Dupree Roberts Jordan and Ian Seau who uh, when they were on the big stage and the big lights reverted back to some old junior college habits and Look, I mean, uh, and and that's not to say that we're mad at him. That's what happens. I mean, the only thing that the only thing that gives you game experience is game experience, mm-hmm. and and we'll be better off for it, and we'll be, you know, we'll learn from it. But but unfortunately. You know, we were going through some of those growing pains against a really good team. You mentioned a, a couple of names there. I wonder uh, other names, maybe some of the younger guys on this team that fans haven't seen yet that, that you got a chance to see on the field in this game and, and like what you saw from them in the first time out. Yeah, I think uh, Elijah Mitchell, uh, a corner, number 28, went out there, played the fourth quarter and really competed. He got up there and challenged people, and I think we'll see him start to earn more playing time. Uh, a a uh, walk-on by the name of Gabe Lee, uh, who is a special teams player, really went out and ran really fast and, and was physical. Uh, Travis Wilson, a true freshman linebacker, 34, played a ton on special teams and I thought played really well. So, um, you know, we had some youngsters that went out there and represented themselves very well and we'll probably end up playing more and more as we move forward. Obviously, you have built a terrific reputation as a recruiter, being able to get guys in. We had a question that came in on Twitter. And by the way, you can tweet your questions at Nevada Wolfpack. Uh, uh, somebody wanted to know, is this a place where four- and five-star recruits want to come and play? And if not, what needs to be done to get this program to that point? Um, that's, uh, that's kind of a loaded question. Uh, a four- and a five-star guy is probably not going to want to come here. And the reality of it is um, there would have to be a very special niche as to why the, re- the reality of it is, uh, in the arms race that is college football recruiting, when you think about a $54 million building that Oregon just built or the facility upgrades at Alabama and the private dining rooms for the, the, the athletes, that's not who we are, and that's okay. Uh, we, have to, we have to find a different kind of player. We have to we have to do a great job of projecting not what a 16 or 17 year old is now, mm-hmm. but what's he going to be when he's 19, 21, 22, and um, we have to develop players. Now the trick of it is the reason you see the Boise's and there's always once a year there's a great team from the MAC and somebody some mid major high mid major is going to end up at 12 and 0, 11 and 1 and in the mix, 
And the reason is, is they, they recruit really good young ones and develop them. And every third or fourth year, you have a great senior class that leads you. And you have that very special year, like the, the 13 and one year here, yeah. you know? So I, I think part of, part of succeeding at a school like ours is understanding who we are and who we're going to recruit and making sure that we develop them. We had another question. We were talking about your defense. A question came in on Twitter referencing the Tampa 2 scheme, which we hear a lot about. And the question was, can that scheme work if your front four is not getting pressure? I think I would tweak that to say, can any defensive scheme work if your front four is not getting pressure? No, well, I mean, it, it's then it's a question of pick your poison. I mean, if your front four can't pressure the quarterback, then you have to make the decision to blitz. And if, you're, if you choose to blitz, now you're putting the guys in the back end in either uh, man-free with a safety in the middle of the field or, in a lot of cases, cover zero, man-to-man with no help. And it only takes one guy to slip and fall, and, and the ball goes, you know, out the gate for 88. And, uh, you know, that uh, it, it's really just kind of a, a pick-your-poison deal. And, and, you know, just uh, uh, philosophically, we believe that uh, more often than not, teams – offensively have a hard time sustaining drives for 12, 13, 14 plays. And eventually you're either going to make a big play or they're going to screw up and, and be behind the chains. And now you can tee off and, you know, right or wrong, it's what we believe in. But uh, I think the statement that you made is very fair. If you can't pressure the quarterback at all with your front four, you got a problem. Let's talk about what's coming up this week as you get set for the home opener against Davis. You've got the first game out of the way. Now the first game playing at home at Mackey Stadium. What does this week mean for you, a chance to lead your football team out there in front of the home fans? Well, it's a, it's another series of firsts for me. Uh, uh, our staff, the majority of our staff, has never coached a home game here. Um, you know, I think, I think the team knows the routine better than we do. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to get in front of our home fans. I'm very excited. Uh, I'm very hopeful that we get a great turnout from the student body. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've worked really hard this this past winter and summer to uh, to get engaged with the student body. Mm-hmm. I'm excited for our guys in terms of some of the new game day traditions that we're going to do, the Wolfpack Walk, uh, when we take the field going down to the band in the student body, uh, staying out after to sing the alma mater and the, and the fight song, and I hope – uh, I hope we keep the, the, the stands packed for that. Mm-hmm. And obviously this one's special because we get the chance to honor Coach Alt and, uh, and uh, you know, take a moment to, to reflect back on what he's meant to this school and to this state and, and uh, get a chance to, as a program and as a fan base, to publicly thank him for everything that he's done here. Certainly be a special weekend, and there are tickets still available, 348-PAC for that, or you can log on to NevadaWolfPack.com if you don't have your tickets yet to come on out and be part of the home opener. Uh, you were very adamant yesterday in your press conference talking about, hey, say what you want about an FCS team. This is not going to be a walkover for us by any stretch of the imagination. Watching the tape, what have you been able to learn about UC Davis? Well, first of all, we are in no position to take anybody for granted after uh, after the score of the first game. Uh, you know, we, we have to treat this uh, just like we treat any other week, and that's we play 12 one-game seasons, and all of our focus is on this team. And I think you only have to point back to some of the teams that got upset in week one. Mm-hmm. South Florida gets uh, beat by McNeese. Uh, Northern Iowa goes and beats Iowa State. Um, UConn loses to Townsend. Um, uh, Oregon State loses to Eastern Washington. There's over half a dozen uh, examples from week one of, of people taking for granted, not maybe not the coaches, but probably fan bases saying, well, this is an FCS opponent, this is going to be a walk, and next thing you know, you're in a dogfight. Uh, when I look at Davis... Uh, I see a very experienced quarterback, I, I believe a four-year starter. Mm-hmm. Um, his backup, who sh- I believe is going to play against us, is a, uh, is a really uh, a change-up because he can make plays with his feet, whereas the starter kind of hangs around in the pocket and throws it. Uh, I know Coach Gould has made a, a concerted effort to try and run the ball better, and they've got two backs that are pretty decent. And when I look at their defense, I see two safeties that are very real players, probably capable of playing in the Mountain West. And I see a defensive end in uh, number 18, King, who's a really uh, – what he, what he lacks in size, he makes up for with a high, high motor and a football IQ. So, uh, you know, we, we have been very clear with our team that uh, we, we take nothing for granted here this week. We're, we're preparing uh, no differently than we did for UCLA. 
Coach Gould is in his first year at uh, Davis. I'll ask you the question that others are asking about your team, which is how do you prepare for a team that you have one game of tape on with a new head coach? Uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, we, we uh, o- over the summer as we were studying to prepare for them, we were actually watching Denver Broncos defense because their defensive coordinator was assistant in Denver last year. We watched some Cal offense over the summer. Um, we've watched a lot of their offense from last year because there were some holdovers on the staff, including the offensive coordinator. I hope I'm not mistaken, but I think I'm right. Um, so it, it's it's not easy, and I know they'll have some wrinkles ready for us, and that's the nature of early season play. And you know, hopefully, we can stay in our base stuff and and uh, not get too complicated and and be able to, like I said before, do what we do, just do it better. All right, should be a fun night coming up on Saturday night. Nevada UC Davis in the home opener, 6 o'clock for the kick at Mackey Stadium. Again, 348 Pack or NevadaWolfPack.com for tickets. Coach, we appreciate it. Looking forward to being here with you every week. Thanks so much for your time, and good luck on Saturday. I appreciate it, and thanks for everybody coming out. All right, head coach Brian Polian with us. We've got much more to come on the Wolfpack Coaches Show, live from the Little Wall. We'll talk with Jim Hoffer, the assistant head coach, when the show continues right after this.
Welcome back to more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show presented by Lexus of Reno. We're live here at the Little Waldorf Saloon. Proud to be Reno's game day headquarters and home for the Wolfpack fans since 1922. The Little Waldorf Saloon where history is made and traditions are celebrated. Hope you can come on out and join us every Wednesday night. We'll be here talking Wolfpack football from 7 to 8. Head coach Brian Polian with us in the first half hour. Pleased to welcome Jim Hoffer to the program. He is the assistant head coach for the Wolfpack and in charge of uh, wide receivers. And coach, first of all, it's uh, it's great to have you here tonight. Great to have you at the University of Nevada. How have you enjoyed your stay so far in Reno? Uh, well, thank you for the introduction, Ryan, and uh, I've absolutely loved it. It's uh, been a tremendous change. Uh, my background has uh, been coaching really all on the East Coast, mm-hmm. and uh, I've absolutely enjoyed beyond description uh being in the west uh love our weather can't say the past couple of weeks i've liked <laughs> the air uh nobody has uh, yeah nobody has that's right uh, yeah. th- that certainly doesn't happen in some of the places that i've lived before tell but, me about the, the situation this is kind of unique because it wasn't that long ago that you were the head coach who hired a very young brian polian to work on your staff and now Coach Polian takes over here and brings you in. This is not something that you see a lot. It's kind of a unique situation. I, I'm sure it is, and yet I'm sure it's happened before. It's a little bit the, the wheel or the circle of coaching. <laughs> uh, like coaching and with our players and in recruiting, uh, so much of our business is relationship-based. Uh, clearly, Coach Polian and I uh, first uh, worked together uh, back in 2001. Uh, for several years, and that's when our relationship began. Um, and it is of, of great respect uh, that I have for him that I'm delighted to be here. Well, you have been in this business now. It's your 33rd year in coaching. You've been a head coach a couple of times. You know, Coach Polian has referred to you as kind of the right-hand guy that he can go to and, and bounce stuff off. Uh, how much do you value that role of, of, of doing your thing with the wide receivers but also being somebody that he can rely on when things come up that, that maybe he hasn't dealt with in his job before? We all have jobs. We all have responsibilities. And, you know, wherever an assistant coach can add value, that's part of our job. Uh, I understand uh, because I've, you know, I got a lot of uh, years or miles under my tires, so to speak. Uh, have seen a lot, but haven't seen everything, mm-hmm. you know. But we solve problems literally on a daily basis, whether it's with our game planning, whether it's with helping a student athlete, whether it's working together with each other uh, as a staff through what's the next speed bump along the way. And when you when you've got some years behind you sometimes you can help avoid what the future problem can be jim hoffer is our guest he's the assistant head coach and wide receivers coach here at the university of nevada i mentioned you've been a head coach twice buffalo and cornell 33 years in this business this is not the easiest business to be in how do you survive for 33 years in college coaching bobby bowden retired obviously at florida state national championship coach i heard him speak once and he said you know the trick is not to be the youngest guy in the room in our business. The trick is to be the oldest guy in the room. Because <laughs> if you can be the oldest guy in the room, you've kind of hung around for a long yep. time. And uh, it's a challenging business. It's a, it's a fun business. It's a dynamic every day mm-hmm. with the things that we face and the things that we have to do. Um, and so it keeps you, in many ways, it, we're still kids. You know, even we're adults, supposedly, but we're still kids. The group that we're with every year is 17 to 23 or 4 at the most, mm-hmm. usually. Um, so they keep us young mm-hmm. because it's it's the same kind of group of people every year. You lose seniors, you gain freshmen, but they're in that same age group. And uh, so it's, it has tremendous benefit as a profession. We get to help educate young people. We certainly get to coach and compete in a highly competitive environment uh, that not very many people are willing to be involved in. If everybody could do it, they would, but not very many do. Now, you played at Cornell. Yes. That was your playing time there. Mm -hmm. You spent two years playing for a guy that I think a lot of people around here will recognize being 49er fans, and especially now with Kaepernick there. But uh, not that long ago, George Seifert was the head coach and won a couple of Super Bowls in San Francisco. And you had the opportunity to play for him as a college player. I wonder what that experience was like for you. It was, uh, well, the truth of the matter is George clearly is one of the outstanding coaches to have coached in the NFL because he was a longtime assistant mm-hmm. before he succeeded Bill Walsh as the head coach of the 49ers. But when he was the head coach at Cornell, we weren't good. Now, we as players 
we weren't very good. And so that was uh, probably a tough and rude uh, uh, two years for him because uh, we weren't very good. You know, and, and he, this first time, now he was the opposite. He'd always been a West Coast guy, mm-hmm. and that was the first time he had coached in the East. Not that there should be any difference, but it was uh, probably at about the time he was getting most comfortable in his job as the head coach and being in a place he'd never been before. Unfortunately, the, the rug got pulled out from under him. Jim Hoffer is our guest, a wide receivers coach and assistant head coach here at the University of Nevada. You come into this job working with probably the most experienced unit on the team, Brandon Wimberly, Richie Turner, Aaron Bradley, all returning from starting roles a year ago. What's it been like working with this group now for, uh, I'd say, the last couple of weeks, but it's been much longer than that throughout fall camp and going into the first part of the season? Well, these, like you just said, these are very experienced guys. There's probably as much that I've learned from them mm-hmm. uh, in regards to this offense, which has has really hasn't changed to any significant degree. But there are subtle changes that Nick Rolovich has implemented as the offensive coordinator. But those veteran guys and other veteran guys on our offensive unit, they've been helpful. They're knowledgeable. I've learned as much from them uh, as as would be possible in this kind of transition. The most experienced of that experienced group is Brandon Wimberly, who's now in his sixth season. Uh, he's had some very good years here at Nevada. Tell us what he specifically brings to the wide receiver group. You know, Brandon is a big man, and so he's a big target for a quarterback. He's got what we would say is a really big catching radius. Mm-hmm. He's got savvy. He's got a very keen understanding about defenses, certainly the defenses that we'll face on our schedule, but college defenses in general. Uh, because of his experience and because of the, the amount of production that he's had, um, he's got a tremendous wealth of knowledge. Uh, but, but most importantly, he's, he's really a great catcher. He's a great catcher of the football. Richie Turner had a breakout year a season ago. What does he add to the mix at the wide receiver position? Richie's very quick. He's very nimble. He has as much change of direction quickness maybe as anybody we have. Uh, And so you can use that uh, at the wide receiver spot, whether it's short, intermediate, or long. One of the things when you try to throw it deep, you have to have guys that are fast enough to get down the field still within the the time frame that the quarterback has from his protection. And Richie's one of those guys that can get down the field because he is fast. When you have guys that have been here and have played, when you come in as the the new guy, so to speak, how do you establish a rapport with those players that have already been here? It's no different than in any other walk of life. You were around them a lot. Um, Getting to know the the young man... Mm -hmm is as or more important than immediately immersing yourself in the football part of it. Mm -hmm. Because if you can find out the things that make a guy happy or sad or what's his story, and if they have any interest, then you can tell them what your story is. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's relationship building as much as anything else. Every guy is different. Uh, Change is often uncomfortable Mm -hmm. for adults. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what it can be with young people. And, uh, and it's just trying to start to get to know them um, and know maybe what caused them to come here. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, what are they studying? What are their modes? You know, some guys study differently. Some of our guys need to study more. <laughs> uh, let's be very clear about that. Um, but it's, you know, attempting to try to get to know them better. And that doesn't yeah. happen overnight. We're running a little bit short on time, but one guy I did want to ask you about, and we saw him uh, really in his first game at wide receiver on Saturday at UCLA, made one extremely nice catch, Hassan Henderson. He's transitioning from the quarterback spot, but yeah. it looks like he's got a lot of physical tools that can help you guys as you go forward. It, he does. Hassan is, a, is an enormous young man. He, he's got really by far the biggest catching radius of anybody we have. He's a gifted athlete. He's got enormous hands. He's learning every day about uh, receiver play. He is gonna. He has already become a very physical blocker. The harder you block, the more those defensive backs want to run away from you, and then that kind of fits with trying to run a route. Yeah. You know, if you can make a block looks like, look like the initial release for a route, uh, it can help a guy get open immensely. But but Hassan's in one game so far. 
uh, made a one of one of a couple really big plays in the game against a good football team. So every week, I would hope he's going to be able to improve and play more, and that'll do nothing but help us if he continues that sure. arc of improvement. Coach, it's great to have you here at the University of Nevada, and we certainly appreciate you making a few minutes to come down and be part of the show. Continued success to you going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. Great to be here. Jim Hoffer, our guest, assistant head coach and wide receivers coach at the University of Nevada. We're live at the Little Wall, and we'll be back to talk with offensive tackle Joel Batonio when the Wolfpack Coaches Show presented by Lexus of Reno continues right after this.
We're back with more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show, live from the Little Wall. Hope you can come down and join us uh, every Wednesday night. We'll be here 7 to 8 o'clock talking Wolfpack football. And our Wolfpack Coaches Show brought to you by Jones West Ford, proud to sponsor the Wolfpack. Reminds of the next home game coming up on Saturday. The Pack takes on UC Davis in the home opener. And tickets are available at 348-PACK or online at NevadaWolfpack.com. Jones West Ford, trucks build tough like the Wolfpack. Uh, getting set for that home opener coming up on uh, Saturday against Davis and a guy that has been through his share of home openers at Mackey Stadium, Joel Batonio, starting tackle for the Wolfpack uh, is our guest. And Joel, one game in, I know things didn't go the way you would have wanted to at, at UCLA, but uh, what was the experience like going to the Rose Bowl and taking on a, a really a top 15 caliber team right out of the gate? But co coming out there to the Rose Bowl and it just uh, that experience, you know, growing up down there and, and being the games as a kid, and going out there was just an amazing experience. You know, we played well in the first half, and we just couldn't close the door in the second half. We made too many, you know, mistakes. But it, it was great. It was, it was a good time. You know, I wish we'd have won. UCLA's defense is littered with all Pac-12, All-American type guys that you had the responsibility of matching up with. Uh, what was that challenge like for you going up against guys that I'm sure you read about going into the game, all the accolades that they've had and the numbers they've put up? Yeah, it, it was um, going into the game, you know, you heard a lot about you know, the Anthony Bars of the world, the Cassius Marshes of the world, the Kendricks of the world. You know, they had a loaded defense. And mm -hmm. as an offensive line, you know, we took it on our shoulders and we wanted to make a statement and try and shut those guys down. You know, and I, I thought we competed well. You know, they're good football players, but I thought we came out and we uh, competed and, and, and fought pretty hard. A staple of Nevada football for so long has been the union. You guys take so much pride in that group up front. This is a group that's in flux. There's some different guys working in and out. Uh, how does that affect what you guys want to do when you might be playing next to a guy for a series and the next series there might be somebody else next to you? Yeah, it, it's a little different than it's been in the past. You know, usually we have five guys that are pretty set, and this year we've, last game at least, we rotated about six, and we have probably seven that can play. So I'm trading off series between McCauley and Connor Talbot, and, and you get used to the guys after a little while, but it is kind of hard changing up every drive. You know, you, you want to. You want to kind of stay with one guy, and you get better when you, you work together, obviously. But but it's something we're working on, and I think by the end of the, you know, once once Mountain West comes along, we'll, we'll have a solid set of five guys going. Joel Batonio, offensive tackle, is with us. Joel was the Baselight big blocker of the game against UCLA. That's brought to you by Baselight Concrete Products. Remember, don't just fight it, Baselight it. We often think about the center as the guy that has to communicate so much on calls and things like that. But as you're talking about, with different guards rotating in and out, how much of that burden then falls on you to be able to communicate with those guys about things that are happening during the course of the game? Yeah, I mean, Gallus does a great job at center, and he, he tells us what's going on most of the time. But but as a tackle and guard, we work together so much that we have to have a good communication. And, and it probably sounds like we're saying some crazy stuff out there, but we have our own little language, and, mm -hmm. and we're working well together. You know, it, it's communication is unbelievably key at offensive line, and, and we're doing a better job of communicating with each other. You have a quarterback that obviously runs a lot in Cody Fajardo. He had 22 carries against UCLA, and we had a question from the crowd here that when you have a quarterback like Cody that is running so much, uh, what's the biggest challenge then as an offensive lineman? Because you know you guys have to keep him healthy and keep him upright if you're going to do what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, when you run the read option offense, it's difficult already as a tackle because you have a two-way go linebackers. You, know, you don't know if they're going to fill the run on mm -hmm. running backs or uh, the quarterback, so you have to be careful for that. And then when you have a guy like Cody running the ball, I mean, it, it helps offense a lot. And he's a tough kid, so he takes his fair share of hits. But, um, you, you know, you're always there to pick him up, and, and he'll be all right. You know, he, he, he runs the ball hard, and he, he loves playing football. So it's all right. I, I love seeing Cody run the ball. As I mentioned, you've been through your share of home openers here in your career. What does this week mean to you, your first game of your senior season now at Mackey Stadium? Um, it's unbelievable. I mean, we have we, – we've been through – so much and, and you know me and a few other seniors have been through so much and I think I think going into it against UC Davis and and, and we got beat last week but I think we're mentally ready and I think it's just going to be a great experience you know some you'll remember forever you've had a great career here before the season I think a lot of us were shocked to see that you were not honored as an all Mountain West pick are you playing with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder this season because of that I just play football as hard as I can. You know, I, I, it wouldn't change if I was first team last year or anything like that. You know, I'm just going to go out there and play as hard as I can every snap to the whistle. Coach Alt is going to be honored on Saturday. Obviously, you guys want to win for yourselves, for the fans, but what does it mean to you to put up a good performance when he's going to be here watching the football team? Uh, Coach Alt's a legend, and, and he gave me my opportunity to play here, and and we got to go out there and, and play Nevada football for 
you know, Coach Alden, make sure he understands that his legacy is getting carried on and we're still doing a lot of things that he implemented here. And, and, and Nevada will always be Chris Alt University. Joel, it's great to have you here tonight. We appreciate you giving us a few minutes. Good luck this season. I know it's going to be a great senior year for you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, Joel Batoni, our guest here on the Wolfpack Coaches Show, presented by Lexus Arena. We're back to wrap it up from the Little Wall right after this. I, I love the colorful clothes you wear.
Thanks so much for coming out to be part of our first Wolfpack Coaches Show presented by Lexus of Reno right here at the Little Wall. And don't forget, we will be here every Wednesday night, 7 to 8 o'clock, talking Wolfpack football with Coach Polian and other guests. We'd love to see you out. Hope you can come on out and join us next week. And if you crave more Wolfpack action, keep up on Nevada Athletics with News Force Wolfpack All Access presented by Champion Chevrolet every Sunday night after NFL Sunday Night Football. We'll see you Saturday, Nevada UC Davis, 6 o'clock at the stadium. We'll talk to you then. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us on this week's edition of the Wolfpack Coaches Show.